Okay, sh shall we begin? Okay. So, so it, it's, a, it's really a great pleasure to, to have uh, Daryl here today to, to, to give us a, a talk. So before we begin, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, all of you for uh, attending. And uh, I would like to, to begin by talking briefly about uh, our initiative of uh, One World Mathematics for Climate. So I think there are two main reasons why we are organizing this with uh, Georg Gottwald. Georg is not here today, he's sleeping in, uh, uh, in Australia uh, with uh, Anna Christiansen and uh, Gemma Shinton. So the two, the two, the two main reasons is uh, first the ecological transition, I guess. And the second reason is uh, obviously to have excellent uh, mathematics and uh, climate discussion. So, so some years ago, I realized that uh, my main personal ecological impact and carbon footprint was due to my own professional travels. And that because of that, uh, I had an impact that was much larger than an average French person. And uh, I guess you might know this for yourself. So I, at that time, I was quite shocked. The fact that during years, I had been teaching climate change and climate impact in school, in outreach events, in front of politicians and so on. And then suddenly I realized that I was not bearing my part of the burden. And so uh, for, during years, I have discussed this with colleagues, but uh, it turns out that uh, this was not an idea that proved very easy to communicate, even when discussing with climate specialists. And so I think now uh, uh, everybody understands this. But uh, as scientists, we really need to change the way we are doing science and quite uh, urgently. And so there are many initiatives in this direction wo worldwide. For instance, in France, we have something called Lab 1.5 to reach the, the, the climate goal, the 1.5 degree goals. And then there are many similar initiatives all over the world. And so the, the fact that the, the things suddenly begin to change uh, f fast, at last, after so, so many years, is amazing in a sense, and it's, it's very positive. So I think that the point now is that uh, uh, with the current situation, we have a, a unique opportunity to begin to organize differently the way we, we do science and the way we conduct uh, our acti uh, uh, activity as a community. And so this One World Initiatives uh, covers many disciplines. So within this One World Initiative, I think we believe that our research community uh, can and will benefit uh, from the development of uh, online communication platform. And uh, these events uh, uh, participate uh, in, a, in a way to this, uh, is a small contribution to the ongoing transformation of, of this uh, organization and practice. And so we hope that uh, this will be more inclusive and uh, with a lesser ecological impact. So this is the first reason. So the second reason is, of course, uh, excellent mathematics and climate discussion. So we really hope that uh, uh, to, to, to have good science together and uh, with uh, excellent mathematics and theoretical physics, and at the same time, genuine application in, in, in climate, atmosphere, and ocean. And we thought that Daryl would be uh, an, an excellent speaker to, to begin with uh, excellent discussion between mathematics and, uh, and climate. So I, I will leave uh, the, the world to Anna or Gemma. Or... I'll just um, introduce now how we're gonna run the seminar. And so the idea is that um, we'd like people to be able to ask questions. And if we need to interrupt Daryl, I hope that's okay if we um, ask for clarification um, on any points. You can post your questions in the chat and um, the hosts will be keeping an eye on that. Um, we are also going to use Slido and I'll put a link in the chat um, to that. And if I can just share what that looks like. If you go to that link, um, you should see a page like this and you can type in your questions here. You can add your name or you can leave it anonymous. And once you've entered a question, other people are able to upvote it. So if we get questions that are particularly popular, 
um, we'll, we'll have some ordering there so we know what, which ones are, are most urgent. So feel free to use that or to use the chat on Zoom. Um, over to Hannah. Great, uh, thank you Gemma. So uh, this uh, it's my pleasure then to introduce our first uh, speaker of the One World Mathematics of Climate series. Um, we're delighted to have Daryl Holm uh, here with us today. Daryl is a professor of applied mathematics at Imperial College London. He has wide ranging interests uh, across fluid dynamics and beyond, um, but recently he's uh, applied uh, himself to studying uh, problems of relevance to climate modeling and climate um, and understanding the climate. Um, so, uh, so, I'm, uh, so with great pleasure then that I introduce Daryl and uh, his talk today. So are you able to share your screen, Daryl? Sure. Great, so Daryl is going to be speaking to us today on applying Kelvin circulation theorem in climate science. So take it away, Daryl. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. I, you know, I'm very excited about, you know, uh, being part of this one world uh, mathematics of uh, climate science. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk on the basis of a project that we're working on at Imperial College called STUOD, which stands for Stochastic Transport of Upper Ocean Dynamics. Okay, and if you, you can find out more about it here at this website <clears throat> at Imperial College, or you can just go to Google and, and strike STUOD and it'll be the number one because this word was never used before in Google and now we can count the number of hits that it generates uh, from zero. Okay, so uh, uh, my uh, abstract is, you've probably seen it, about climate change and its impact, uh, its importance, uh, and its components. So the components are to make the distinction between weather and climate, uh, to understand the dynamics of the fluctuations of the physical variables, and to predict how the variances of the fluctuations are affected by statistical correlations in their fluctuating dynamics. Um, I'm gonna discuss a model which can begin with this sort of thing. And let me explain in the context of oceanic heating due to global warming and the Stuart project about why are we discussing this problem? So given that the oceans have absorbed 93% of atmospheric heating due to human greenhouse emissions, what are the questions? Will this absorbed heat affect global ocean circulation besides sea level? Will atmospheric heating actually change the ocean currents? And how will that change in ocean climate affect atmospheric climate? And then comes the point. What do we mean by climate? What do we mean by ocean climate? What do we mean by climate of anything? And the issue, the issue is uh, how to answer this. And I'm, I've been struggling about, uh, over this for a, a long time. Uh, I do know that it has a probabilistic aspect and I was trying to understand that even 30 years ago when we were doing global ocean circulation modeling at Los Alamos. Uh, and part of the approach that I developed to try to understand it from then, it's called geometric mechanics. So what is geometric mechanics? Geometric mechanics is structure preserving, in our case, appro approximations, but fluid approximations via Hamilton's principle. So why would we do that? Well, it turns out that if you, a reduction by symmetry of Hamilton's principle leads to the kelvin murphy theorem, and that actually is familiar. Uh, it is an expression of Newton's law uh, for mass, the rate of change of the momentum of a mass that's distributed on a fluid loop, uh, and 
is acted on by an external force distributed on this uh, fluid loop. And the, the fluid loop of the course is moving with the Lagrangian parcels. And the momentum in, inside the integral, the integrand of this is the momentum per unit mass is in the Eulerian frame. So the velocity is, uh, the loop is moving in the Lagrangian sense. And the integrand is an Eulerian object. And all of the fluid equations, which follow by doing asymptotics to get Boussinesq equations or the hydrostatic primitive equations, or Lagrangian <coughs> averaging, get generalized with Lagrangian mean, you get closures like the Euler alpha model, or you can insert Hodge decomposition, you get balance equations. And all of this is done by approximating the Lagrangian and Hamilton's principle. Variations. I will give you the equations. The equations always have a Kelvin theorem. And in the case, in an ideal case, they always have something which is analogous to the conserved PV for these equations. Uh, and the, the conserved PV is a feature of the Hamiltonian formulation. Uh, the the genre transform will take us over to the Hamiltonian formulation. It gives us Lagrange, Euler Lagrange, I mean, sorry, the Eulerian conservation loss. These are critical points for uh, relative equilibria associated with nonlinear stability. So there's this whole machine here, and the Poisson bracket is not the usual canonical Poisson bracket. It's a Poisson bracket that has a kernel, and the kernel are these conserved quantities, and PV is one of them. Okay. So this is the structure. What do the equations look like? <clears throat> oh, that's how they look. Okay, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the slide. I just want to point out to my students uh, that when we're talking about inducing perturbations uh, with respect to noise, there's a lot of freedom to inter introduce these perturbations. Okay, and uh, we're going we're gonna to use some of that freedom, but um, my students should look at this as we go and say, oh, yeah, we could have done this other thing. So when you take these variations, you obtain these equations, even in the stochastic form. Uh, they, they, I have a, a set of approximations inside the Hamiltonian that takes you to all of the usual suspects. Uh, uh, Bertrand, Chaperon calls this the tree of knowledge that's descending from the reduced Hamilton's principle for fluid dynamics. Okay, here we will discuss a single stream of thought that links ideas from Ed Lorenz to Bob Craignan to Henry McKean. Uh, and just these are the ideas, the basic ideas. But what is climate? Uh, Ed Lorenz in a famous uh, paper said climate is what you expect and and so it has a probabilistic uh, quality to it and of course the other part of this quote is weather is what you get okay and so how to make geometric mechanics stochastic is what we need right if we're going to take this approach uh, and the idea is to constrain the variations in the reduced Hamilton's principle to follow Bob Craigman's idea that uh, the Grangian histories would be stochastic. For the Kelvin theorem, this means that the Lagrangian loop moving along Lagrangian histories uh, is going to move along a stochastic process. And then how to derive the dynamics of expectation. Right? We need to know what to expect. That's going to be the climate. <clears throat> and here we follow Henry McKean. We use mean field my, uh, ideas plus stochastic fluctuations. So in some sense, the mean field would be the climate. Uh, the sum would be the weather. And the message is that the correlations among the stochastic fluctuations, even multiplied into the mean field, uh, in a complicated way, uh, drives the equations 
for the expectation. So they really are equations for the climate that are driven by correlations of stochastic fluctuations. And there are equations for the moments of the fluctuations. So they can tell you, for example, how these uh, correlations are resulting in increased means, increased variances, extreme events, these things. So uh, this is a framework for answering the questions. Okay, so we'll discuss work that was done with James Michael Leahy and, and, uh, and field drivers you know, over the past year or two. Uh, here is Theo pointing to his favorite equation. And uh, here's me, this is my favorite. Okay, so where are we going in this talk? So we began with Ed Lorenz in 1995, emphasizes climate as a probabilistic concept. Uh, I used to do a lot of hiking with Ed Lorenz at Los Alamos and in Boulder. And uh, he didn't, it, there wasn't any need to wait until 1995. He always said that. And Bob Craigman postulated the stochastic Lagrangian paths as the basis for turbulence theory. And so our problem is to derive fluctuation dynamics around an ensemble average path, that's our expectation, and then derive the dynamics of the variances. So we, for this, we'll go back to basics and answer the question, what is advection mathematically? So we, we will review the role of the deterministic advection in, Hel in Kelvin circulation theorem. Uh, and then notice in the proof that this, you know, of, of, that this is associated to Newton's law when the momentum is in an inertial reference frame. That's the only time that Newton's law works. Uh, and put McKean's mean field stochastic advection into the Kelvin inertia theorem. And we'll find these expectations and fluctuation dynamics separate. So basically what happens is the under certain conditions, the uh, uh, expected, expected uh, solution is a subset of, of, it is a deterministic subset of a bigger set that includes the, uh, the expectation and the fluctuations. And in certain cases, it separates. And then we can look at some work examples. I, I think we'll look at something simple like 2D Euler. And we ask ourselves, okay, maybe you can ask me and, I, and uh, grill me, uh, but does this approach really apply to climate models? I, I think that you know, since this is a day of voting, if we were to vote for this, probably they'd say, uh, well, look, look, there's so many other things. And that's right. Uh, um, well, but for example, suppose it was in the simple model, does it say anything about extreme events? Okay, so Ed Lorenz told us climate is a probabilistic concept. Uh, and, he, and then Ed Lorenz was a very thoughtful guy. You know, I mean, he would ask questions all the time that just didn't occur to other people. You know, for example, uh, he asked, uh, is, is it somehow inevitable that some earlier time that the climate now would be uh, as it actually is? Right? I mean, he really, that's the way he would ask it. He would ask it, you know, this is a passionate question that, you know, that he wants to know. Uh, and now, I mean, it's, it's, these questions are still persisting in quandaries uh, in the titles of modern papers. And everyone who starts working on climate, you know, gets into this situation. Okay, if climate involves expectation, what quantity is stochastic and how should we determine its probability distribution? So here we use Craig then. Okay, so we propose the Lagrangian histories are stochastic. And that means that each Lagrangian history, which is passed, it started at X zero and is mapped by some spatially smooth time dependent diffeomorphism, smooth invertible map, uh, and produces a path uh, in space 
this time derivative to be stochastic, and this is how we choose uh, to make it look. We have a this stochastic Lagrangian history will consist of drift velocity and noise. And when there's no noise, we should get back the deterministic equation. So we're going to apply this vector field, this stochastic vector field, uh, to material loops in this kelvin nerser theorem. And this will produce a set of equations we call SALT that we're using in SUOD. SALT stands for uh, stochastic advection by Lie transport. And it applies to stochastic transport in the upper ocean dynamics. That's what we're thinking of. Uh, and the ensemble average then will determine the probability distribution. And the determination of C is the hard part. That has to come from data analysis, right? This is where the physics will be. This is where the data analysis will be. And we are taking data, which may be much finer than we can compute with. And so we want to uh, bring in the effects of what we don't know and model them as noise, which is correlated. These Cs can be correlation eigenvectors of whatever we want to correlate. Okay, so what I is stochastic? I, yeah. I may ask you a question, so probably you, you will. So what are you describing exactly? Are you describing uh, uh, flow, for instance, the ocean, as we see afterwards? I mean, are you describing what the, the, the how should we interpret these uh, averages? This, uh, this all statistic? of these, all of these, all of these will follow. Okay. Uh, all of these will follow. Okay. So these, this is going to be uh, applicable to any of the fluid dynamic theories. Okay. We're just, we're just changing the Lagrangian trajectory and all the other uh, fluid dyna dynamical problems will follow suit because we're doing it in a way that preserves the structure. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. We'll do an example too, we'll do examples. But anyway, I just wanted to have some idea about why we might make a decomposition like this and to a part which has a mean and a part which has a lot of fluctuations around it. This is data. This is, this is satellite data of drifters around New Zealand uh, since 1981. Each drifter has a different color. And you can see it has correlations. It has correlations like these, the roaring 40s currents. Uh, it has, you know, the colors show some accumulation uh, and there is this obstacle, right? And it's flow around this obstacle. Uh, but the flow lines, you know, even though these are not Lagrangian history, so flow lines are reminiscent of the idea of the decomposition. Okay, so each Lagrangian path is stochastic, and we're going to represent the fluctuations away from the ensemble average path. Okay, so we suppose that we have the histories of the fluctuations from the ensemble average path, like all of those pieces of data we just saw and produced a velocity of expectation of velocity E of U. And uh, these, and let's take these uh, paths to be generated by smooth diffeomorphisms. Okay, and the vector field looks like this now. So we're, we're going to replace the, the uh, drift velocity by the expected drift. Okay, so we call this sum, we call it U twiddle. And it's a it's a function, it's the tangent, you know, uh, and it's the it's the time it's the velocity in the sense of a stochastic differential, following this uh, history, uh, which is uh, the Lagrangian path generated by this the characteristics of this vector field, and we'll take it to have no divergence right now, which will mean both that one and that one have no divergence. So. We substitute this into the material loop in Calvin's theorem and, uh, and calculate uh, 
okay, just the, trans the transport and, the, and whatever the momentum is in the inner ground, uh, it gets transported now around these loops. <clears throat> and the loops persist as an ensemble of stochastic paths uh, with, the sh with the shared expected drift velocity because the flow maps preserve neighbors. So once your neighbors are on one time, you're always neighbors under a smooth invertible map with diffeomorphisms. Okay, so now back to basics. What is advection mathematically? So according to Arnold, these Lagrangian trajectories or histories are curves on them that are generated by the action of diffeomorphisms parameterized by time so that, okay, this is the history. And, and is an identity uh, um, map at this time t equals zero. The velocity is the tangent, okay, that, of this curve. Uh, and what about advection? So we choose a smooth k form, and we say it's advected if the pullback by this map, right, which means evaluating along the uh, trajectory, uh, acting on the this k form some differential form, something you integrate, is equal to its initial value. So everything, you know, that just means all along the path, this k form keeps its value. And this quantity of phi star from t, phi star is called the pullback by the map phi sub t. And this is what it is. It's advected if it satisfies this. And if we take the time derivative of it, we're taking the time derivative of the pullback, so that means take the time derivative of this form, which appears, um, which depends on time here and there. And uh, the time derivative of the pullback is the pullback of the partial time derivative plus the lead derivative. And since this is not changing, this is a partial differential equation uh, for how K evolves along the path in an Eulerian sense. So advection is lead transport. So this is advection lead transport. And then we're gonna make it stochastic, so it'll be salt. So here are some examples of deterministic advection by lead transport. For functions, yeah, we've seen this. Uh, for uh, two forms, uh, for vorticity, we've seen this. For densities, uh, that's the continuity equation. Uh, and well, for the motion equation, we've seen this too, especially when we look at partial TV, partial TV, and we say these two are equal. And this is the fundamental vector identity in fluid dynamics. And we call it, uh, as a, just a coefficient, we call it the lead derivative with a capital T acting on the, the coefficient here, D, D, D. But so that's uh, advection. And we are, we've been speaking advection all our lives. Okay, so the deterministic advection in the Kelvin theorem uh, is just use this theorem. Uh, the time derivative of this loop, in order to get the time derivative inside, we have to pull it back, pull back the integrand by, uh, to, uh, by the motion of the, uh, of the loop. Then we take the time derivative, we get the lead derivative, and it's equal by Newton's law to the integral around our moving loop uh, of the force. And the force for us is uh, one form. And the, and the momentum per unit mass is one form. And this V here is the, is the momentum per unit mass and the loop is moving along with a velocity u. Okay, this is the proof, but I won't go through it because I spent so much time on, on, on the k form. This is what it is for one form. Okay, that's the end of the deterministic <coughs> invection. So now we begin salt. Uh, so the stochastic Kelvin Earth theorem uh, also exists for the uh, Lagrangian averaged, okay, drift velocity in the sense of the key, where the drift velocity is the expectation. This expectation is going to be the quantity that corresponds to the climate. 
Uh, this is noise fluctuation that's going to produce the fluctuations around the climate. But the climate is not this guy per se, it's the, the result of having been infected by this guy. Okay, so we let M V be the momentum per unit mass. And the Hamilton's principle that comes from taking the variational derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to U. Uh, and then the stochastic Kelvin Ritter theorem represents Newton's law concentrated on an advecting fluid loop, which is now advecting with our, with our uh, new stochastic uh, velocity U twiddle. Okay, nothing's changed. That's why uh, this is gonna to apply to everything. Once you, you have something as a Hamilton's principle, you reduce by the, uh, and look for invariance under these uh, diffeomorphic maps, which means you go from Lagrangian coordinates to Eulerian coordinates, then all the Eulerian fluid theories satisfy the same equation. Okay, we need one final definition. Okay, before writing down the equation. So this definition is diamond, a diamond operation. Okay, so it takes a product, it takes uh, a vector field and the dual of the vector field in the sense of variational principles into the dual of the, um, in the dual of the vector fields, which are, are dual in the sense of pairing uh, with L2. Okay, so B diamond A uh, paired with velocity U, velocity is a vector field, B diamond A then is going to be a one form density. And okay, this is a pairing on the vector space and it's dual. Uh, then it's equal to the L2 pairing of the minus the lead derivative with respect to U on A. Okay, and uh, we call that thing uh, the pairing in B, the two different pairs, pairings, B and, and X, and this defines diamond. Okay, so now we can write down the equations. These are the salt Euler Poincare equations. All, you know, you choose, you choose the Lagrangian for the fluid dynamic theory you like, and this is the equation. Okay, now we replace, following McKean, the uh, uh, loop velocity, the drift velocity by its expectation for this stochastic process, stochastic process. Uh, and then we're gonna modify it. Because this guy here, if we were to take the expectation of all of that, this would be a mess because that's product and involves gradients and everything. So um, here's why, you know, this is our equation. We can change this equation because, you know, we own this equation. And we're going to change it by uh, taking the expectation of this variational derivative. This is an expectation of a vector field. This is an expectation of something which is dual to the vector quantities. And the vector field is dual to the momentum. Okay, this is what we're changing about the theory. Okay, we're gonna still, we're, so we're changing by putting expectation here, and then we're separating where we put the expectation in the variational derivative. These are the LA salt theories. They're called LA salt because an expectation is being taken along a Lagrangian path. So it's at a fixed uh, Lagrangian coordinate. So it's a Lagrangian average, LA. Okay, so there is, I told you we can go to these from the Hamilton's principle to the Hamiltonian form of the equations and there would be a Poisson bracket, which wouldn't be the canonical Poisson bracket. It would instead look like this. Uh, but in the the we the and the uh, Hamiltonian would be obtained from uh, the Legendre transform, and it would satisfy this equation. And u u would be replaced by dH d mu. There's dH d mu. That's our expectation for the drift. Now you see why we did that uh, because. Uh, we took the expectation of DLDA, but we did it so that when we're in the Hamiltonian form, the variations with respect to the, uh, the, vari the, the variables that are going to become the climate have the expectation in front of them. 
now. This is the same Poisson bracket before. Okay, so you actually still have all those conserved quantities like PB for all the theories that are specified by whatever Hamiltonian you have. Then those, those quantities are called casimirs, okay, or casimir functions. Uh, they have the property that when they have the Poisson, you take the Poisson bracket with them, with any Hamiltonian, they give zero. And so for all these Hamiltonians, you'll have these casimirs. Um, however, uh, although they share the casimirs because they have the same Poisson bracket, they have the same Lagrangian invariance, then the solutions of the LA salt equations, however, because we made these modifications, they're neither variational or Hamiltonian. They're just Poisson. Okay, so that means they're not a mean field theory in the sense of McKean. We've wandered a little bit away from McKean's uh, direction. So uh, now let's uh, look at the Excuse ethos. me, Daryl. Okay. Excuse me, Daryl. Yes. Uh, I think those two last slides are uh, fundamental for what you, you are doing. So maybe uh, it's important to, to, to understand better. So what are this salt equation exactly? Is it something, do you make an, an, an hypothesis on something or do you, do you derive but, them but from- One more slide, one more slide, Freddie, we'll do an example, okay? Okay. Okay. So the, the key point is when we go to ETO, we have, we have uh, an ETO process instead of the Stratonovich process. And we have a double lead derivative as the, uh, the ETO variation, quadratic variation. And we have this expectation here. And when we take the expectation of the equations, this term drops out. This is already an expectation. This, this, is, uh, this becomes a partial time derivative of the expectation of mu. Uh, and just like I said, this drops out. That's already an expectation. So that becomes an expectation. And you have an equation which is as a subsystem, is a partial differential equation, and it can be written only in terms of expe expected variables. Okay, and in the particular case when dH dA is linear, so H is quadratic in A, and dH d mu is quadratic, so it's linear, then this, this equation is, can be closed, and when the Xs are constants, their functions, you know, just uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, this is an obvious self equation, okay, when you choose the H to be the uh, kinetic energy of the flow, this H. That's gone. This becomes the viscosity. Okay. Uh, well, let's do an example. Uh, this is about the fluctuation variables. Uh, we have a summary, but let's, I'm mean, still doing an example. Okay, ready with anyone to example. Okay, so for a special case of these equations, uh, there's the uh, Navier Stokes equations. Okay, so in the, in the case where the divergence of the expected velocity vanishes. Okay, and the Ito formulation. Uh, this is this is the ETO formulation we're just talking about. It has ETO noise and it has a, a quadratic variation. And then taking the expectation gives us this equation here. Uh, when the Cs are constant, this is the Navier Stokes equations. When the Cs are not constant, then this is a deformation of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and, and and there are conditions on C for which it's elliptic. So then it becomes a, a Lee Laplacian, so an obvious Stokes equation. Uh, yeah. Okay. And when when the when the when the Navi, as long as the obvious Stokes equation is well posed, then uh, its Eto fluctuation equation will be well posed too because it's linear. Okay, Freddie, is that example okay? Yeah, yes. So let, uh, there is a question by s somebody else, uh, Manolis Perro. Manolis, do you like to, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, in the previous slide. Um, uh, 
Uh, yes, I, I was wondering. So, so little h is the reduced Hamiltonian on on your orbit. Yes. Um, yes. But and mu is the momentum, right? Yes. Okay, but what is a i a, what is the little a? What it, uh, does it these represent? Are, these are these uh, here. Okay, yeah. so they satisfy this equation here, right? This is a uh, vector field. Uh, and uh, these are Lee Poisson equations. Uh, this, is, this is, yeah, this is the Lee, this is the Lee Poisson equation, and this is the advection. Okay, so any quantity which is advected satisfies that's the equation we looked at before. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, I'm going to go forward. Uh, it, it any any quantity. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to the slide you asked about. Is this the slide you asked about, right? Yeah, okay. So, so A is, uh, if, is we, if we go, if we go, if, if this were deterministic, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, I, I, I still want to go back. Uh, yeah, okay, let's go here. All right, if this were deterministic, this would be gone. Uh, this would be the Variation of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum is the velocity. This is going to be the, the drift velocity in the case of the, uh, and this is the lead derivative, and this will be a partial derivative. And so anything that is invected will satisfy this equation here, where you, multi you operate on this guy with that one and nothing on this one. And this is its partial time derivative. For, so all invected quantities satisfy this equation, and this Poisson bracket is anti-symmetric, okay? And this is its anti-symmetric part. Uh, when this is goes into the motion equation, uh, that's, and that's where the diamond comes in. Okay, so this is all of the fluid equations, okay? All of the ideal fluid equations now made stochastic, and, uh, and then, uh, the drift is uh, produced as an expectation, not local in the probability space, not as expectation, following the key. Okay, okay, so A means A means advection. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, I will. Uh, we talked about this guy closing, and okay, and we show the example of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and now let's talk about the fluctuation dynamic. Okay. So the about your example. Very... Sorry, could we come back to your example for the Navier-Stokes equation, please? So. Uh... Okay. So, so uh, here the result is that you obtain the Navier-Stokes equation mm -hmm. uh, as the fluctuating equation, the, as the average. No, it's, it's not fluctuating. This is the expectation of the, uh, in the formalism we set up. And when the Cs are constant, uh, then the double E derivative here is the Laplacian. Okay, and you can have some coefficient. Uh, and then this would be the Laplacian acting on the expectation of U. So that you can think of that as the viscosity. This is the expectation of the pressure, okay, that comes from the advected volume form. Uh, this is some external force, okay, and this is uh, the advection, this is the nonlinearity for the Navier-Stokes equations. So you obtain the Navier-Stokes equation for the, for the average, so... Yeah, for the, for the expectation with this, yeah, with this modification. So under, the so under which uh, hypothesis? The hypothesis is that the energy is the kinetic energy the integral of one half uh, u squared. 
and the divergence of that is zero, right? And that divergence being zero is imposed by the pressure. We put that into Hamilton's principle, take the variation, we make it stochastic, then take the expectation of the drift. We operate uh, with our, this time on the Hamiltonian side, uh, and out comes uh, the Navi Stokes equations with the different elliptic operator in general from the, uh, the, the Platian. It's a double E derivative. And uh, on a manifold, the double E derivative is, in fact, yeah, on the half the double E derivative on the manifold is equal to the Laplacian plus the Ricci scaling. Okay, so it's, it's a geometric object. It's related to the Laplacian. Thank you, Darin. There is another question by Stefan uh, Griffiths. Okay. Yeah, this may be a bit off, off target, but um, Early in your presentation, you were talking about the, the potential vorticity is, is materially conserved in all of what your formulations are here. In the yeah. ocean, when, when we have a full nonlinear equation of state, we have thermobaric effects and no longer have material conservation of a PV. Um, yeah. Is that just sort of a, a sidebar in this theory? It's like a, a special case that's not, or can you comment on that basically? So that's not, not something to worry about, or is it something that is a limitation of what you're doing? Oh, it's a limitation. There are so many limitations. The limitation is I'm starting with uh, ideal uh, flow. I'm introducing some stochasticity. I'm changing to uh, uh, changes from Stratonovich to, to Ito and they give me a drift. Uh, and that's, and, uh, and, but it gives me this quadratic variation. Uh, no, and so that that this is a just a way of sneaking in something that models uh, you know that looks like a model of dissipation, even though it's secretly it's kind of it. Uh, and in terms of all the things like buoyancy, right? So if you introduce buoyancy, buoyancy will be one of these advected quantities, one of these guys. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Now, in this, in this formula here. Here, buoyancy will be one of these, okay? In 3D, there's still PV, okay? But if you wanna have horizontal gradients of, of uh, buoyancy in 2D, in the, you know, say you wanna do the Euler's homogeneous uh, equations, uh, fluid equations for divergences, divergence with fluid, but with uh, an invected buoyancy. Uh, and you want to allow for a gradient of the of, uh, horizontal gradients of this buoyancy. Uh, then you lose, P you lose PV altogether. Okay, and you have things like thermal QG, where you have uh, the, the interaction with the flow with the with the gradient of the, of the buoyancy produces the, by things like Rayleigh-Taylor instability, uh, all kinds of high wave number instabilities. Uh, all that stuff is part of the theory, uh, but the Casimir's for it, the, the PV is no longer the integral of any function of the vorticity in 2D, it's the, it's, the, it's the integral of any function of the buoyancy in 2D, but then, uh, or it's the integral of any uh, function of the buoyancy in 2D times the, uh, well, in terms, in times, in times the vorticity in this case, the scalar of vorticity in 2D. So instead of going from the integral of phi of omega squared uh, in two, for 2D homogeneous Euler, for 2D inhomogeneous Euler, you still have Casimir, you still have this whole structure, but your Casimir, but your PV is not conserved anymore. Okay, you, you get a weaker, you get a weaker conservation now. You get instead the integral of uh, in, in 2D uh, or in QG, uh, PV times uh, some function of the buoyancy, but not any function of the PV. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, Steve. Okay, I have to decide how much I'm gonna talk about. Let's, let's, let me talk about the, the fluctuations and then I'll, maybe I'll just, should I just make a summary? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, so the fluctuation variables are these differences. Okay, if we take the difference between the ETO forms and, uh, and the expected expectation equations, then we get uh, these equations here. Okay, <clears throat> when these guys are, these variational derivatives are linear because the quantities involved are quadratic. Uh, you can pair these equations mu prime with their and a prime with their the fluctuations with their dual variables in l2 like if you pair a density with the scalar uh for an invected quantity ah uh, yeah right okay so let me see what you get um uh, uh we did this special case we have this fluctuation uh, this is our fluctuation equation uh then we can actually calculate the variances, okay, of then the dynamics of the variances. So these are expectations of the differences of the fluctuate of the solution from its mean, okay, and uh, it's and, and the point about it is that the, the variances in both the momentum and in the fluctuations of the affected variables are driven by correlations of, of, of operators acting on the quadratic uh, combinations of the uh, fluctuation variables, the fluctuations. So the correlations of the fluctuations drive the variance of then so this is the thing which is driving the uh, extreme events for example you simply identify what it looks like that will drive the variances when you write the when you write down this equation because uh the equations for the fluctuations are linear okay so you simply define the fluctuations as the solution minus this expectation and you ask how does the variance evolve this these are the equations for how the variance evolves okay so i'll, I'll stop uh, i think i'll stop here maybe i'll do go back to this much of the summary okay so this non-locality and probability space and these lagrangian average salt equations uh simplifies the dynamics of the full glorious stochastic equations in three ways. The Casimir's are still preserved, but the expected physical variables separate into an expected variable, separate into a dissipative subsystem, which is embedded into a larger conservative system. Okay. In, in many cases, the fluctuation equations are linear stochastic equations. The solutions are transported and accelerated by forces, okay, which involve the expected variables. Uh, and in some cases, for example, the 2D, the Grunchian average salt, euler bosonesc equation, this linear stochastic transport property implies unique global existence, which is not possessed by the corresponding uh, stochastic salt uh, euler bosonesc equation. Uh, okay, that's what I want to say. So, so, so we have some questions. Thanks a lot, Derek. So, is it is it the, the end of your talk or? or? The, yeah. Okay. Yes. Forty-five minutes. This is forty-five minutes. Yes, but excellent. So, do we have more questions? So Daryl, at the beginning you, you, you talked about the, the, the data and so you show this example for the ocean right. dynamics. So how those uh, mathematics are related to the data on the ocean dynamics? Okay, so uh, 
you know, we've been working on this for four years now with Dan Cushion, Colin Potter, uh, and postdocs Wei, Wei Pan and Igor Shubashenko. Uh, we've written um, four papers on, on this. Uh, so the, the basic idea uh, is, and it, it is to uh, compute the trees uh, uh, by treating, uh, for synthetic data, we treat the uh, fine scale simulation as the data and we compute with the core scale. And then we want to model on the core scale uh, the parts we are not computing on the fine scale. Okay, and we do this uh, by uh, comparing the, uh, so it's a comparison with data. So at every coarse grid scale, first of all, we coarse grid to find the fine, the fine grid solution. Okay, and, uh, and that's going to be the truth on the coarse grid. Uh, and then we, at a given point on the coarse grid, we start with some initial condition, which is chosen randomly, right? And then you, at each course, at each course grid point, you take one step with the course with the course screen uh, computer uh, uh, code and simulation, and you take say 50 steps with the fine grid scale with that initial condition from that point, and you compare it, uh, compare the endpoints of those two, uh, and ask what's the difference between these two calculations. One is the truth, but written on the course on a course grid scale, and the other one uh, is uh, you know just one step of the course grid simulation. So you bring it back, you bring back this difference, which you can think of as a vector. The thing was a vector in uh, in R three. You bring it back to the course grid uh, point, and then you change it and you ask for another random initial condition and another one, another one. You do an ensemble average for calculations at that coarse grid point. Uh, and, and what you do with your, your, your analysis is you do EOS on, you do EOS, EOS on this uh, uh, to calibrate the data. You do EOS on, the, on this ensemble of runs and you take the uh, correlation eigen, eigen vectors of, the, uh, of these displacements from the uh, course grid points, uh, and those uh, correlation eigenvectors uh, uh, normalized by their dimension uh, are the Cs at the point, at that course grid point, uh, that's that C. And you do it for all the course grid scale points. Okay, so you get a vector field uh, that uh, that's now takes values on the course grid scale, uh, and so you and you ask, okay, so you can look at the spectrum of the EOFs to find out how much correlation they have, and then you have, and then you can ask yourself, uh, if I, how many of these do I need to take until I can stay until the spread will, the truth will stay in the spread uh, for a, a significant enough time that I can call this a, a sensible, uh, you know, comparison. Okay, so that's why we, we want to do this because next, after having uh, decided how many of the Cs you have to choose and, I, and identifying them, uh, it's all calibrated. You need you now know, know how many that you think you know, think you need, and uh, and you've reduced the problem from as say five twelve squared or ten twenty four squared. Uh, down to uh, 64 squared, okay, for 2D oil, let's say, or for 2D QG in the channel. Uh, and you've got that. You've got this comparison. You've calibrated. You know how many Cs you have. You have to have so that every course uh, grain, every course grid point will uh, have a trajectory which will, of the solution, you know, in the velocity and whatever else you're calculating which stays within the spread of the noise uh, long enough to take, say, five or 10 coarse grid scale uh, points. Okay, then comes the data assimilation. So 
But I, instead of 64 squared, maybe you look at four squared or eight squared. Okay, and and, uh, and at those points, uh, then you know you you what you do is you look at the fine grid scale answer at those uh, 16 points or 64 points, uh, and then you do data assimilation uh, based on uh, particle filters. Okay, you, so you do you do a form of Data assimilation of particle filters, which involves a three step process it's called tempering and jittering and nudging. Uh, and there, is, there are uh, some amazingly good comparisons once you do data, once you've done this data assimilation. Uh, the comparisons uh, the comparisons are so good. There, there are, you know, I could have given a lecture about this, but the comparisons are so good uh, that it can't be that the particle filter needed to be looking at uh, the number of degrees of freedom in the fine grid scale. That's just impossible. Okay. But somehow, though, this process of calibration is reducing the dimension of the problem basically down into the maybe the dimension of the span of the of the seas. Uh, so the particle filtering method is very effective. Okay, so that, that's, uh, what, that's, that's what we're doing with it. We have four papers written about it. Uh, I think two of them appeared in the, the Journal of Statistical Physics earlier this year. Thanks a lot, Daryl. Uh, I, I like very much this uh, connection between uh, geometric fluid dynamics, stochastic approaches, and uh, what you plan to do with the data. So uh, do, do we have uh, any more questions for Daryl? There is one in the chat. Uh, Daryl, you can unmute Joy, Joy, would you like to ask your question yourself? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, hi, Daryl. Uh, so I'm just trying to think of how uh, this might apply uh, in the atmosphere. So if you think yeah. of uh, a, a jet as some sort of expected climate state, uh, and you have uh, 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 Rossby wave packets uh, that are propagating along this as some sort of uh, fluctuations. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about evolution of variance, uh, uh, does it make sense to think of wave breaking as uh, the evolution of the variance? Is that how uh, one thinks of this problem? I don't, I, I don't know how to do wave breaking. <laughs> I don't know how to do wave breaking. <laughs> yeah. I, we, I remember we used to work, you know, I, I hear about Peter Smolikovich's work on planetary boundary layer and, uh, you know, and the wave breaking that developed from acoustic waves uh, propagating uh, and nearly vertically in, uh, in the atmosphere, you know, and energy dissipates, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but the, uh, the idea of uh, using a smooth invertible map with, uh, it breaks down when you try to use a smooth invertible map with the wave breaking because uh, you can no longer invert it. That's right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So you lose the sense of Lagrangian trajectories when the wave breaks. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So uh, even if we uh, don't think of uh, wave breaking, but it, it, say I'm trying to understand the variance of some tracer uh, that's being uh, advected by this uh, Rossby wave packet and you want to know uh, when the variance uh, of this tracer somehow uh, increases. Uh, so uh, is this sort of the correct formalism to think of that kind of a problem? So are you talking about adduction of particles by Rossby waves? Yes, uh, so uh, essentially yeah. you have it uh, and then you have uh, uh, meridional uh, advection uh, due to these Rossby waves, uh, which are essentially uh, perturbations onto the jet. <laughs> I know. Uh, 
wave current interaction is, is hard. Okay, uh, so they're not, they're, waves don't advance particles. Uh, waves propagate on the frame of the motion of the fluid, and then there's some additional mysterious interaction, uh, which is described by uh, basically it's that the wave is not in the same frame as the fluid. Uh, like in the case of Stokes drift, uh, yeah. and and then and then when there's a shift in which the wave is propagating, or the wave the wave has produced a uh, a momentum, okay, an additional momentum in the uh, uh, in, in addition to the total momentum, okay, which has a now it has a fluid part and it has a wave part. Uh, and if you know how that wave part evolves, or if you can prescribe it as, for example, with the Stokes drift, you just prescribe it as some field of velocity depends on space, and you sort of guess where it came from. Uh, then you get, you know, then, then you've shifted the momentum, uh, you know, the definition of momentum into the other frame. And you, and you can also, you also think about that as uh, writing the velocity of the transport as a uh, as relative velocity to this motion that's been induced by the waves. Okay, mm -hmm. in that case, you you get a force like the Coriolis force uh, or the Craig Leibovitch force, this vortex force. That then you're saying that the wind uh, has done something to the fluid. There's been this, and then there's after after you sort of model what the wind did to. Uh, to add a momentum to the fluid, uh, to the fluid, to the to the kinematic momentum, just the density times the uh, velocity. Uh, all right, suppose you model that, uh, then you can compute a force. Uh, but now you're going to take Rossby waves. Okay, let's take Rossby waves. Uh, so the, you know, what's the what's the momentum of a Rossby wave? Uh, do you do you want to make a guess? Uh, Maybe. Um, <laughs> someone have a guess? Uh, okay, well, I mean, it's okay. Suppose we say that it's proportional to the wave vector and has some, uh, some property, uh, like and maybe it has even something to do with the dispersion relation, depending on the wave vector. And now the wave vector is the gradient of some function. Uh, like the phase of the wave. Okay, are you thinking about Rossby waves that somehow are doing advection by uh, normal to the level set of the phase? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, oh. just uh, as one thinks of uh, uh, extreme wave, uh, events such as heat waves caused by uh, advection uh, of temperature uh, as a passive scalar, let's say. Uh, by these Rossby waves that are driving with jet. So ex excuse me, Joy and uh, and I. I think. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Let's talk about this outline, uh, online. Let's talk about like, uh, uh, offline, but online. Okay. Yes. Well, oh, th thanks a lot, Daryl. This was really a stimulating talk. I think that uh, everybody uh, could. Uh, I don't know if we can clap here online. How it works. But, there is uh, a, a reactions button at the bottom, and if you okay. click that, you can do a little. But we can actually click. Thanks a lot. Darren. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. It was a wonderful experience. Very collegial. Thanks for the questions. Okay. Uh, I hope to see all of you again. Ciao. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, thank you. I'll use this opportunity to advertise our next uh, seminar, which is uh, Nikki Vakauchen uh, on the 1st of December. Uh, she'll be talking on towards stochastic modeling of turbulence in the stably stratified atmospheric boundary layer. So Zoom details to follow uh, over the mailing list. I hopefully see you all there. <laughs>